things, but it might be slightly. But he might be doing doing them a certain way for a reason. Plato's super smart. Might okay? be doing for a. It's hard to find guys. I mean, he was like Leonardo da Vinci or other super genius polymath guys. Plato was an extremely bright guy. Yeah. But Plato comes with idealism. Not a friend of democracy. All right, he comes up with the concept of idealism, which what? is an no, 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 no. The, the, the smart guys should rule. Philosopher King is Daniel. You go downstairs checking your dance computer. Enlightened despot is Plato's idea. And he comes up with idealism, which is important because you will see, I, whenever you have a political movement or philosophy, like Marxism, it breaks into Platonic and Aristotelian forms. Yep. And so they overwhelm it. What's Aristotle the, the Aristotle's the realist. Platonic and Aristotle. Er, Platonic is the ideal. Like Plato? Aristotle yeah. is the is the uh, this Nominous. is a, this is a, a super gross misapplication of it. But Aristotle is like trying to be the realist. This is how the world works, and Plato is like this is how it should work. Well, not only that, but Plato says there are ideals. Like there's the ideal of a dog. Yeah. And all dogs fall. Our society fall short. Can, yeah. And, and reflect the reflect the ideal. Some, some dogs more than others, right? Okay. But there is a specific ideal dog. It's like Naomi barely reflects. No. Yeah, okay. well, there's not really an ideal dog, but there's the concept of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Aristotle is a nominalist. Uh -huh. And Aristotle there's just dogs. says there's dogs. Each dog is dog. Each dog is individual. Yeah, and, and, and Plato's saying some dogs so are closer Aristotle to Aristotle like, react, like, reacted to Plato and well, said this is... No, no, he wasn't, no, Aristotle was doing his own thing. you got to remember Greece is full of philosophers. There's an old joke. Aristotle is trying to describe the natural world, for example. He writes the whole thing about, about here's how animals See the work. guy who said there's fire, work. water, earth, air? Well, that, other guys that, said that before him. but That was just a presupposition. Yeah. He, he, he's See trying the guy to who said there's atoms? Here's what the world is like. He described the whole world. Okay, And then you have Plato saying, hey, if we did this society, we'd have the perfect, as close to the perfect society as we can get, and it would be awesome. See, Plato's the one that comes with the idea that what we really see is a distorted uh, reflection of reality. Oh, the, ca that, the cave thing. That was Plato? That's Plato. The man in yeah. the cave. Not Socrates. And, and the Greeks thought that we were like people on the back seat of a train looking backwards. And so the train goes into the future and we see the past. And then Plato uh, changed that to the man in the cave who sees glimmers of reality, but not reality itself. And so the real and is Aristotle's that, trying the to describe reality. reality. Okay. Whereas Aristotle, Aristotle was contemporary or after? Aristotle is much later. But the, but he's later. No, later. He, no, I mean in life, real life. He uh, was Plato was dead when he was alive. Yes. And what happens is, isn't Aristotle the one that trains uh, Alexander briefly? So he's around in like. Briefly, Alexander didn't really. Is learn Alexander? Much, yeah. Alexander, he, he, he'd be like the worst student you can imagine. Wait, wait, is right? Alexander like 300 BC or 30 BC? Like 300, 400 BC. 400 BC. Okay. Yeah. So Alexander. Oh, wait, 200. Yeah. No, not, but it's not. It's not 30. Alexander studies under Aristotle. Uh, and even if, and even though he studied, he, he's influenced by Aristotelian concepts, right? Okay. But see, Aristotle. Everyone is. Everyone is influenced by Aristotle. Or, but they're all influenced by both these guys. And so right now you've got two strains of communism. Yeah. One is and an both idealistic. Are, and both are influenced and by both nominalist. Plato and Aristotle. And they may not admit it, but that's part and they, of it. They've abandoned the, the core philosophies, which is Hegelianism, have been abandoned. And instead of Hegelian, they have either nominalists or idealists. Yeah. And people break into nominalists and idealists all the time. Not just Marxism. Naturally. Yeah. It's, it's a very seductive because it's, let's, let's take, let's take One the, single uh, person can break and be on one side, they can be a nominalist and idealist at the same time on different issues, right? Yes. But, but let's, let's, say, let's say if you're a green, okay? Mm. Do you believe you should always strive for the ideal or are you willing to compromise and work toward things incrementally? You're either a nominalist or an idealist. Right. And there are people who are unwilling to compromise. They're the full idealist. Well, let's take Ralph Nader running for president so that Gore can't get elected. Yeah. In some ways, that's an idealist because the other guy is too nominalist for him. Right. And so the greenest person running for president ever got destroyed by a green, right. not by the opposition. But it's very seductive because it, 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 it tends to overwhelm. And if you follow, like, uh, church history. Steve's on the list. <laughs> it's Sandy and Steve's. Yeah, Except can't the plane is reality. Here? Yeah, just because the camera can't show whatever. You can keep talking about it. Make sure you're all arguing. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're okay. I'm sure everyone would be. That greatly interests me. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so mainly we're just going to um, talk about the call to the game and uh, where it came from and the origins and uh, the whole field's part. So, uh, um, this is really formal. We're going to take this here. We all just want to 
sort of program that up there? I guess was, you started American Gothic, or? Okay, a long uh, time ago, like, Sandy Peterson was capable of generating a new game system every three weeks. <laughs> uh, and doing a finished product every three weeks. So that we had time to do the, uh, everything with the artwork. Give me Janelle for the artwork for some reason. <laughs> and Janelle's slow. But, but Janelle's so, slow. Okay, so we would play. We kind of had a room quest campaign going on. But, you know, Sandy would introduce new stuff all the time. And eventually, he introduced something similar to a Steve Jackson game with Thulo Mythos as one of the scares. And that was really neat. And Steve said, you should, do, you should do an American Gothic game. I said, American Gothic? What do you mean? It's like a horror game. I thought, oh, that'd be cool. And I like Lovecraft, so I've been kind of a Lovecraft devotee. Um, in fact, a brief record on that. 1963, when I was eight years old, I had I had one book in my dad's giant science fiction library that had Lovecraft stories in it, which actually is from 1942, the book I had. I lost it for four years, met a friend four years later who was the one I wanted to do without remembering, got the book back, and oh, because you couldn't find Lovecraft anywhere. It was, it was out of print, there was nowhere to find his books. Uh, I eventually like started trying to find other sources of Lovecraft stories. This is the one book only had a few stories. I went, the college library had all the first Arkham House editions, <coughs> so I checked those out. And then they found out that the first Arkham House editions were valuable, so they put them in the locked section where a fourteen-year-old couldn't get at them. And then finally, when I was seventeen, Valentine brought out the Arkham edition of Lovecraft stories. So for the age of eight till seventeen, I'm spending like a sizable amount of my imaginative time trying to find out where I can get a hold of Lovecraft stories and read about them. And it's really hard. So when I finally, look there's finally something more common, so I'm really excited about it. Um, great, uh, Steve knows Greg Stafford and encourages me to write to him and look at some of the things I've done. So I wrote to him and I did a collection of monsters for uh, Rude Art Some Calls, a few little things, room quest things. Then I talked to Greg and said, hey, I'd like to do an expansion of um, uh, a room quest set in Lovecraft's Dreamlands, which is a fantasy setting where there's like swords and stuff. And Greg wasn't interested because he had someone actually here in Texas doing uh, a, uh, a, call it a game on Lovecraft called Dark, or like modern era game. I was really excited to hear that. I said, oh, can I proofread it or do anything? I'm really excited about Lovecraft. And Steve, uh, Steve's the one that put me on to write to Greg. And then Steve had been doing this other game on the side, which I hadn't really talked to Greg about. I mean, I had the American Gothic game Greg a couple times, but I hadn't gone that far. And uh, I didn't have, I mean, I had a game system for it that was, like I said, based on kind of on the fantasy trip. Um, from the Jackson games. Oh, my first natural <coughs> yeah. So, so Greg says, Greg talked to the other guys at Castle, I learned this later, and they said, well, you know what, this other guy in Texas is not doing things very fast, we're not getting much response from him. Uh, he hadn't produced much, and Sandy Peterson never missed the deadline, and he's a huge Lovecraft fan. And Chaosium were not huge Lovecraft fans, but they were smart enough to know that they wanted to have a huge fan make the game. That would be for a better game. And so they just turned the whole thing over to me and said, hey, why don't you do the whole thing? So I asked them to send me the stuff that the other guy had done, uh, Sean Summers actually, was who it was, and they never did. So I just did it all from scratch. And he said I could do a game system in, in, in two weeks, but it took me a year to write Call of Duty. Um, That's because we had to play cast. Yeah, well, and I had to, I had several different games. We used to actually play which doesn't always happen. We actually, play, we actually played it. And, and then I and, and I, I just I discovered I was onto something in one of the in like the first session of call of it ever with using the the, the sanity rules. Uh, the, uh, if you played Call of Cthulhu, then you know the scenario of the haunted house that's right there in the book. That's the first scenario ever made for Call of Cthulhu. The one that they have that they, like the guy in the basement who's all bitter and bad. Still in the present edition. Still in the present edition of the book. That is the very first scenario ever run for American Gothic, and then it became the first scenario ever run for Call of Cthulhu. That's it. You play that, you play the first one. Ever. He killed my With the Duke same Black. map, the same map I used back in 1980. And the monster killed my new flock, uh, Jess with Chris. Okay. I, remember I don't remember if you were knocked out the window. Everyone gets kicked out the window by the bed, right? Yeah. But uh, so, so, I'm, so, I'm, so what happened? I'm playing it, and, and there's a book, and the book had, and people find this book. What does this book, what does it have in it? And they're reading the book, and I'm losing sanity, and, and uh, the book says, How to Summon a Malign Creature from Another Dimension. It was, in, it was like a dimensional champ or spell. I didn't tell them that, because I thought I should. Shouldn't get that information out. Just tell them it's a scary thing. Um, and so they, so they say, okay, we're, we're going to go in the basement and we're going to, um, we're going to summon this thing. We think that's the house. So we went in the basement and 
you know, they had like the severed cat's heads and the pentagram and they, whatever they had to do to suffer the thing. And then the moment they see or something, I said, okay, there's a creaking in the air and it opens up and something starts to come through. And then like out of the, out of the six players, like three of them said, one of them said, I'm running away. Three of them said, I'm covering my eyes so I don't see it. And, and at that point, suddenly I, I realized that that would never happen in D&D. Like, they're, they're purposely not wanting to see the monster and know what's going on. I said, there's something here that is going to be, that's going to work. You know, I was really, it was, I was really taken aback. It was a, it was a completely different uh, attitude from what I, I mean, you know, I was just doing a role playing game based on horror stuff, right? I wanted to have monster be scary because it monster did, but the, but the emergent behavior of the players is what, tri is what tipped me off that there was something extra here. It wasn't just about guys having power or getting really getting was that, Yeah, the sandy rules were in the game. That was when we played. That was, that was, it, was it? actually, yeah, that was the first time I had the sandy rules. Uh, the, the legit sandy rules. The American Gothic game didn't really have sanity. The monsters did shock you or something, but the sanity rules where you had the sanity that would go down and not walk again. And that's that when you would be called through. That's the one unique thing about it that no other thing at the time that really set that apart was that not only could your character die, it's actually uh, much easier just to go nuts. Well, well, well the, 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 the fundamental paradigm in it is that, is that the better you get at Cthulhu Mythos, the crappier you get as a character in some ways. And so, you're, and so like, the whole goal of most role-playing games that we must gather more eeps and get up higher in level and get more and more power, it's completely absent from Call of Cthulhu because it's mimicking like a horror story or, or a horror movie. Well, you, you don't, really think you don't get better at it, right? Because man is not meant to know. Because That's the thing, yeah. You really get character. And so, right. and so, like the bad guys have all the lore and knowledge, and then there's the fact that since it's a horror movie, like the weakest monster in the whole game, which is probably another human who's a cultist, is just as strong as you, maybe more, because he's like more ruthless and insane. So, everything's better than you. Like a lot of the game is based around exploration and not and, and discovering things, and you know, it's just a completely different worldview. And the fact that it's so different is, I think, what sets it apart. Because, like, I love playing. More conventional. I mean, I, don't, I, don't play, I haven't played D&D &D for years, but well, I guess I played it last night. But, but I play conventional role playing like RuneQuest and stuff all the time, right? Where, where you guys are getting better characters, being stronger. But Call of Cthulhu is like, uh, you do this and you don't have to worry about that. You know, when I play Call of Cthulhu at a, uh, at a convention, of course, the expectations are that like everyone will die, then, you know, maybe the final girl will live, right? But <clears throat> I use that in the movie, the horror movie sensibilities, the final girl. Pick out the person in the slasher movie is going to survive, right? And so the person, one, one or two will survive, and they're like, yay, we live. I mean, but no one seems to care when they die. Because one thing, like, I guess you don't get as invested in the Call of Duty character. Because you haven't been playing him for seven years and gotten up to be the lord of the castle. You're just, you know, a druggist or something, right? Well, the expectation, of course, is you're going to die. There's that. It's a horror movie, right? Yeah. What kind of horror movie would it be if nobody died? You're going to exit it would be a lame one. You can exit the status of being a player character. Right? It would be like Graveyard um, Encounter. That you got in the lover bottom where nobody died and you were all mad about it? Yes. <laughs> but, but if you look at the original Lovecraft story, many of the narrators survive uh, the Whisper in Darkness. And, yes, uh, he totally survives in Whisper in Darkness. Yeah, but, so it's kind of the expectation. I mean, I but, but, but there are casualties along the way. And in fact, in, in the movie which I produced of Whisper in Darkness, at the end, like there's like a switch room on the narrator. He's not as big a survivor as in the story. Well, no, I mean, that's it. I mean, he survives technically because like his brain is alive and working. You can plug in the things he can talk to you. Yes. <laughs> the survivors retire, yeah. and so a survivor, a survivor who retires, is basically a survivor who's become an NPC. In the working fear, the guy, the hero lives, but a lot of guys get off along the way. You know, and I don't, I don't care if they live or die. It's possible. I mean, it's not. It's not. It's not about killing the players. It's about. It's about giving the players a serious threat that could kill them. And if you're presenting that, then sometimes that threat must kill them or it wasn't ever serious, right? And it can kill them because, it shouldn't kill them because like, you're a mean keeper, but if, if no one ever, if you play Call of Duty and like at the last minute, of the, like you always pull your punches, then the players will no longer be afraid, so. And occasionally, you know, it's not bad just to kill everybody. I mean, and you don't have to kill them. Like, that that was you can transform them, you can carry the brain in the can, you can drive them insane. You don't have to kill a character in Call of Duty to have them not be in the next adventure. You can give them a treasure reward. Here's your reward, a moldy old book that you go, you're out of the next, and, well, as, as the great quote, is you're out of the next adventure because you looked at the pictures, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> But on the other hand, 
let's say the characters have done everything right and they survived and nobody's died. Then you can just That's cool them. too, right? Then you can give them all a nightmare, kill them all off, and have them all wake up in the morning alive. And that way they've all died anyway. But not really. Or even say, hey, you are. You lived, you're great. I, I remember a couple times in Call of Duty, I said, I'm pretty sure someone's going to die today. Maybe all of you. And then they go through it and like, no one died or a little person died. And they were really proud. And I said, hey, well done, dude. This is the top. But they knew they could have. They knew that, that when the, when the Shoggoth comes oozing under the wall, that if they don't do the right thing, they're going to die. It's not that, there's not going to be a deus ex machina. If anything, you're going to have diaboli ex machina again uh, in Call of Duty, right? Some horrible thing left been, oh, you thought you lived, but look, there's a Shoggoth. <laughs> or, you know, machines that actually do generate monsters. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The second scenario of uh, Shadows of the Ark in fact, has a machine that is powered by a Shoggoth with a giant wow. piston. It's like that's operating awesome. the piston to make power. The time now, when you think about an action game, you don't necessarily think of Call of Duty, but no. uh, so, so many games turn into, uh, let's have three guys with Tommy guns, um, you have to load the truck up with uh, oil, gasoline, and... I, I'm, sure, I'm certain there's games of Call of Duty like that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, because the bad guys... Most all the ones I played when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, well, when you're a kid, yeah, it's all different, right? But since, I mean, like, your Tommy gun is not going to do against a werewolf, right? I mean, are you, are you really going to set fire to the Shoggoth? Really, is that how you're going to deal with it? I'm not sure that they're flammable. <laughs> You know, there's like there's so many ways they these things we they have things that eat their way to you through time. You know, your your Tommy guns are not going to save you, right? There's monsters that when you look at them, like you you you, you retreat into uh, into infancy. So all uh, part of the thing in the in, in the game. When, sometimes when I'm in the game and the guys are like arming themselves up, I just think it really clear at the start how pointless that is. You know, and one way of doing it is like, look, it's a ghost. Okay, <laughs> open up the flamethrowers. Like, okay, um. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, Well, and the other thing is, you have dream lines. They have dream lines. They can, and occasionally, idea. yeah. An occasional bloodbath shoot 'em up is kind of fun, but I think of all of, in all game systems, the, the game system in which the monsters are the most invulnerable to the firepower has got to be Call of Duty. And there's certain satisfaction as a game master and letting your players have whatever they want. Yeah, sure. Game, it's not oh, yeah. When players say, can I get dynamite? I say, you betcha. <laughs> you know, there's a blasting site down the road. You can go there at night and steal all the dynamite you want. And then they're usually discouraged and don't go get it. But, right. or it's, it's a 1920. But the point is, the dynamite or the or the, or the Tommy gun, all that stuff that can call through, it's just a tool. The purpose of the dynamite isn't to engage in combat with the monsters. It's to, like, plug a gate, destroy a house, do something. Right? It's a, it's a tool like a shovel would be. You know, or, or a flashlight, I think, usually. Tommy gun might be a little bit safer, but there's, I mean... Kill yourself when you're about to go insane. Yeah. Well, you can kill cultists. You can kill cultists, but the cultists can have guns, they too. They're just, too. they're exactly yeah. equal to you in yes. that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Except they don't worry about the police coming in. Right, <laughs> they have their problem with it, right? Well, now, when you look at, uh, when I first started playing, I first started playing Call of Duty, when it first came out, I saw the first box of the shell pulled off. And um, there's certain so structure. Probably. Yep, certain structure emerged of adventures is that uh, you hear dark rumor or something bad. Yeah, I always get a little bit from your you uncle. Do, you do research, and there's, there's something bad in the old house. <laughs> and then you go confront the, or hopefully armed by the research with kind of a vague idea of what you're facing. And was that a deliberate kind of structure of the? Cult I think every culture? game has to fall into some kind of structure, and because the haunted house had that structure, someone wants you to go check out the haunted house. Let's do research. And that's kind of how the Lovecraft stories work, too, though. The guy would do research and then find out some horrible, horrible thing. But, I mean, the fact that, that a lot of scenarios are that thing is like, how many scenarios in Dungeons & Dragons have started with you sitting around in a bar and a mysterious guy comes up and says, I have a quest, or the king has a quest, or, like, someone has some, right? There's, there's, there's a structure to every game, right? And the structure in Call of Cthulhu is, yeah, you have to go investigate some terrible thing. Because if you, if you, because otherwise, I mean, how else can you get the person into the adventure? Do the terrible things come looking for them? I guess they could, and sometimes do. But mostly, you have to go investigate something. That's how you do it. That's why you call them investigators. And not only that, but giving you can play it. Yeah. Go ahead. giving a structure is important, so that people running the games know what to do, and people playing the games know what to expect. A big problem with a lot of games is that they don't teach you what to expect, and that's why a, a, a scenario. It encapsulates the core of the game is an important thing to package in the box. This is, this is how it works. And then you can certainly have scenarios that are highly variant from that. Like, for example, the one I'm running today, right? But, but uh, you still have that core thing. You know the standard stuff. And sometimes you have nephews who 
say, I will taste that black liquid. Have you seen Tim Cass's yes. latest um, thing on Facebook? An optimist looks at the glass and says it's half full. A pessimist looks at the glass and says it's half empty. A gamer says, I drink it. What happens? <laughs> <laughs> Now when you, so when you delivered that, so you wrote the call to the game, what was the Chaosian's first reaction? To okay, so the Chaosian guys didn't like Lovecraft at all. They, they had no respect for him. They were, they like, they read other things, like, like Michael Warcock or something, right? Well, they didn't really so, like Michael Warcock, right? Well, they liked him more than Lovecraft. Yeah. But, uh, but so, I, uh, I, I, I wrote it and sent it in, and they, but they, and they needed a hook to get themselves interested in the game. And so their hook they chose was the 1920s setting. They said, oh, we love the 1920s. That's really cool. I love her world in the 20s. It's in the 20s. So they added the 20s source book and all the other stuff. And so when, when they went on call to the conventions, it was always like, let's go on a Zeppelin ride. Like, let's go to a speakeasy. Let's do 20s stuff. Okay? But when I write a call to the game, while there might be some 20s elements in it, like you could buy the comedy gun, maybe it would be about it. Like, I, my vision was always that Lovecraft was writing the stories in the modern times. He had the most modern things possible. The discovery of Pluto, airplanes, Antarctic exploration. This was, right? So, I mean, it's claimed that if Lovecraft was writing the stories in 2012, they would be taking place in 2012. They would be taking place in 1927. So, so to me, the, the setting wasn't the relevant part. Okay? But, but to them, it was. So they added all the 20 stuff and had that be their hook. And that kind of got them into Lovecraft, which was, which was good, you know? And then they rewrote the rules because my first draft was was even darker, and they were always the optimistic guys. They wanted to right, and so they, it was the and my and part of my view there was like it's fine to be the optimistic guys and all, but but part of the differentiator of color Cthulhu is that it's not the happy feeling sure. game, right? That is this incredibly dark universe. So one thing that's interesting about color Cthulhu, if you play a lot of playing games, is people that are good at other role playing games have been included in color Cthulhu. So the paradigms told them. The paradigm is totally different. As I was talking to uh, Strider Champ uh, last night, I remember in a, in a very early, to, to compare the two things, there's the Call of Cthulhu example, the very first game of Call of Cthulhu I ever played, a full Call of Cthulhu, where they said, I hide my eyes, I don't want to see the monster. Well, I, I, I contract this with one of the early games of D&D I played in one of Steve's dungeons, where in the middle of the dungeon was a giant room full of magical bricks. Okay, and so magical bricks, pile up, fill up your backpack with them. So we fill our backpack with them, and we lugged these things all through the dungeon. And the, apparently the main effect of the magic was that you'd go slow because you had a backpack full of bricks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in D&D, like, you would, but in D &D, wouldn't you want to have a backpack full of magical? They're magical, right? So we all have the magical bricks, okay? And, and so, and like, and it, make, it makes total sense within the context of D&D. But in, but in Call of Cthulhu, it also makes sense that you don't want to look at the monster. And of course, if you found a room full of magical bricks in Call of Cthulhu, you would not carry them in your backpack. You'd probably be panic struck. What do they want to build, right? But, but the, the whole outlook is completely different. I think that's one of the reasons that it was one of the first, in a sense, it was like a gateway game for women in the gaming world, because it wasn't all about killing monsters and gathering loot. If you killed the monster, it was like at the climax of the adventure. And even then, it was killed because you poured cement into the hole or something, right? It wasn't because you fought it, okay, usually. So, so it was attractive to women more than I think some of the other games. I, mean, I, I knew several campaigns that were all female campaigns. And they ran a pretty different from the male ones. One, one group of girls had one in Wisconsin. They said, oh, we've been running this college game for five years and none of us have ever died. I said, okay, well, <laughs> more power to you. But uh, it's very cautious. I imagine there's a lot more relationship action than, uh, than fighting. If they, no one died in five years, maybe the keeper was super nice. But, uh, but th there was, yeah, the paradigms were very different. But I think, when play so that's why the Call of Cthulhu perhaps unfairly has the thing that always the game where you go into and they kill all your characters. Well, it's certainly more that way than the D&D is, or the fantasy role playing games, because there's that risk. But the point of the, it is to be scary. If your characters can't die, it's not scary, so it must be possible. There's a risk of death in D&D, obviously. People get killed all the time, but it's not focused in the same way. And the other thing about it, the scenario packs that they did, especially when Sandy did, sold very, very well compared to the normal pack. Plus, they were, at one time, they were at 90%, which means for every 100 sets of rules they sold, they were selling 90 copies. That's a really huge, so, so people like the scenarios. I know a lot of people that bought them just to read them. But some of them bought them and they actually played them. I think one of the things we had going for us is because we weren't tied to you must get better at the end of the scenario. 
and you can kind of do anything you want in the modern world, that we actually had a lot more variety. You know, how many how many college food scenarios don't have anything resembling a dungeon, right? About like, okay, 99.59% probably don't have a dungeon, but you know, there was a, there's a huge variety in, these, in the college food scenarios that that if you took, took a giant stack of DB adventures, there's some variety, but I mean, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of there's different monsters you're fighting is the difference. Whereas in Kulu, it could be that there's an auction. So uh, auction for an occult well, thing. Or, thing or your friend is in an asylum and you got to break him out because the, the, the doctor is a portal shara. One thing that does in the early adventures, especially with uh, the shadows, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which you did, was the travel, the world travel. Yes, you go all over uh, all all the world. world. That was like a big thing is that you, you yeah. went adventure in Brazil. Oh, that the shadows Europe. read as well. Yes. You but, could, but, people would buy shadows to read it and not play it. One of the huge advantages that we have in Call of Cthulhu, because it's in the real world, is actually the stereotype thing, where if I have a guy come in who is a, like, a Zulu, like, there's all kinds of baggage that goes with him being a Zulu that the other players are gonna play off on, where if I have a guy come by, come by, and he's like, from one of the continents of Harn, and I have explained to all the characters what that means, he's kind, and I may be explained, like, he's kind of like a Scotsman, Right or whatever, but I can just have an actual Scotsman in Call of Cthulhu. They're Scottish. It's a Scottish werewolf, right? And 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 that and that that sh that that would be shorthand to do a lot of stuff. And that's the advantage, really. I think of if you have a long, a large, long-standing campaign background, where you have a world, you know, Greyhawk or Glorantha or wherever that you have a world that all the players know really well. You have that shorthand to serve you, and you can have those stereotypes. You can say this is, you know. This is a dwarf from, from the Mountain Hold, and the players know what that means. And using real world gave me that very easily in, in Call of Duty. In fact, that's what Gary Gygax was trying to do with Cambridge Journeys. Yeah. If, yeah. He so, wanted, yeah. He intentionally, when he came up with the setting, he intentionally wanted one that paralleled the world so that you could take characters <coughs> and you had that immediate background. Yeah. And Master and Lanthanite, when you get a tramp steamer and you're sailing across the ocean, Okay, there's a lot of things that go along with being a trans steamer you don't have to explain. The crew is kind of seedy, you don't really trust the captain, you know what the same, it looks like the ship on Alien, right? Because that's, Alien plays off that same thing, right? And whereas if you were gonna go on a sail across the street in the Golden Galleon, okay, in a, in, in a fantasy world, the game actually explains things, well, there's a below decks and a mid decks and the crew, and you have to tell them the crew is seedy, tell them the captain's untrustworthy, explain about, right? There's all these things that, that use up game time in a sense. Whereas, whereas in, the, in uh, Call of Duty, I can say the shifty-eyed crewman like looks like he was going through your things in your cabin, but maybe he wasn't. And then you're like, oh, these crew—they're all in on it. They're missing. It could be. It, it, there's other things you think about right away because it's the real world. So that was a help. But then, of course, there's the horror element, and if the players know. One of the advantages of the Call of Duty, since it's about the unknown, is if they know about the horror, it's terrifying. And if they don't know about the horror, then there's the mystery thing, and it's still terrifying because. I always found Call of Duty was a really good game for people who have never played RPGs before. It's very easy yes, to play. Yes, it's easy to get in. They don't, they, don't have to, they don't have to, they can just say things. I want to try to, to read the giant scroll on the wall in German. And it's, you say, oh, you have to roll this die or whatever. But, but it's easy to say what you want to do. Because most RPGs build up a huge wall of, uh, you have to know this before you get to here, where it's called the you're set in the real world. Right. You don't have to, have to, you don't have to know that stuff. And, and, and the stuff you're discovering in the game makes sense. And not only that, but stuff you, as a character, would discover, the player can discover at the same time, and it's okay. There's the fragments of a black chicken in the room, in the fire, and they can think about it and say, voodoo? I don't know, there's something going on, right? Or, right? And, and also there's the fact that every game system, and Call of Duty is no exception, the most complicated and cumbersome part of the game system is combat. And every other game system, the first thing that happens when you start learning to play is you go into combat. And in Call of Duty, the combat doesn't happen for a long time, or maybe never. And so they don't have to deal with the hardest part of the game right off the bat. Now, one of the other good things about Call of Duty—they don't have to worry about strike ranks, they don't work right or whatever they have. And so, yeah, initiative. One, you can simplify combat a little. Call of Duty is a pretty simplified combat. And the other thing—one thing you don't have to like attacks and parries and armor. You just have a gun and you shoot and you hit or miss. That, that makes it simpler. But even so, it's still the most complicated part of the game. Yeah. Because you have to roll to hit. There's a damage. There's who goes first. But you don't have that. It's not as important in Call of Duty, right? Yeah. It's more like the bed suddenly moves and tries to knock you out the window. Well, another thing that's um, hard to pick up a lot of the games is the magic system. And yes. The magic system in Call of Duty is really easy because if you use magic, you're probably going to go insane. Or, yes, or, you, or, don't, you, you don't use hardly any magic. And if you do use magic in the game, it's like a big plot element. 
and the new players don't have to know any of it. And because they don't know any magic. And it can be overpowered without any balance problems. Yes, because only the bad guys get it. Yeah, no matter how mighty the spell is, I'm not worried about the player learning, you know? <laughs> I'm just safe. You know, let's say I can summon It's like a world where the, only the monsters get the magic items. How good <laughs> is that for a master? <laughs> <laughs> and another, another good side effect of this is that standing effect from Greg Stafford. And uh, something you may or may not know is that any application you might want to use me in a game design context for the feedback, Sandy can fit that seamlessly and do a better job. And so once I got Sandy in contact with Greg, uh, Greg uh, started writing the game for less. And I could focus on only... I'm sure he two. loves Steve just as much. I could focus on responding to the only things I was interested in, um, which I thought was great. And I was left largely alone to do Call of Cthulhu because the other guys didn't get Lovecraft. And they wanted to like give maybe maybe these stories should be more optimistic. And I said, there are plenty of optimistic games. I think we should be contrarian here. One of the things that um, you mentioned that called the Cthulhu book that I always took to heart because I was a Lovecraft fan also was the mention of the Derelict mythos. Yes. And you make really clear uh, so that, that was that direction you wanted to take it versus hey, did anybody else say, oh no, no, we want it to be this way? And you said no. They did, the, other, the other guys at Cassian didn't know enough to realize that there was a Derelict mythos. Just all the same. Yeah. And uh, so I actually use bits of it because sometimes it's cool to have both as a fire god, right? But uh, but yeah, in general, I wanted to have the, 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 the bleaker thing because, again, like I said, one, I think one of the, in a sense, not an obvious one, but like other horror role playing games that came out after mine all had the more positive thing where you get more power. They were more like a professional role playing game. You get like chill, you get more power, you get stronger, you have a government agency funding you to give you your missions. That's super convenient, right? And but in the end, it's like Call of Cthulhu was like the proletarian game because you are just a guy, you know. You are like you're a druggist or a taxi cab driver or something, and you don't have a secret government agency funding you. You don't have a secret organization funding you. You don't have powers greater than the mass of normal men. If anything, the knowledge you have makes you more susceptible to problems, right? But so it was, it was like you against the world, and so and so every victory you had was like super awesome. Yeah, another thing that happened as a result of that is that that's the same thing. Well, it was already out one. No, we got the, the free, remember? We just... Oh, yeah, we did get a free with this copy back when you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. y'all yeah. well, we'll fixed it then? <laughs> What's your like yesterday? Well, we played it and said these things are on. Un un well, remember, I can't say Andre. Can't say Andre is the king of not being an Alice in game design. Okay. And, 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 and that's part of the charm of his designs is that, is that he has something that goes over the top. He's just like, well, okay, it's over the top. That's how it is. You know, Ken, right? You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. and so that's part of the thing of his game designs is that he has stuff you can be like supremely powerful. You can have a guy who casts a spell that kills every single person in the game. And that's okay with him. Okay, so Stormbringer, and of course, he's like actually a pretty good guy to do Stormbringer because Elric is kind of all about casting a spell that kills every single guy in the game. That's right, Stormbringer. And so, but it also had to be a game system. That you can play. That you can play. And you, right, so we had to work out what does it mean to have demon armor? And it, of course, in, in the stories, a guy has demon armor, and that means no one can hurt him. We said, well, what if I have demon armor, and the bad guy both have demon armor? I mean, we can't just both not be hurt, because we're not going to fight. So we had to, like, work on rules. And, uh, and I used to interpretably invariably use it to that meaning to But I would invariably end up with every flaw in the rule system incorporated in my characters. But Cthulhu <laughs> was break proof you couldn't gather enough, enough power to break the monsters. After you fixed the book system. <laughs> I just had a habit. I didn't do it on purpose. The book I system? Just, the book system used to have a way that it would yield you unlimited knowledge. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. But that was bad. Except you only got the one penalty. Oh, okay. It got fixed. But I used just to kind of find little flaws like that, and I wasn't really thinking about it. I just do it become, you know, second nature of my character. And when you were done, when you were making the call to do wasn't even aware of monsters, um, did you have any conscious idea that, uh, how did you say, well, the deep ones are going to be this, the dull ones I was be torn this. to do the monsters because on one side, I thought, like, at first I gave stats for the gods. I said, this is dumb. 
the God shouldn't have staff. They should be the all powerful things. And then, and then I, I originally just, then I, so at Chaosium, they had a copy of the monsters, the gods with stats, and a copy of them where instead of having stats, they just had effects. Cthulhu gobbles up one d4 guys in each round, right? And you don't fight him. He's like Cthulhu. And then they, when they published the game in the first edition, they had both the effects rules and the stats rules in the same thing. So you like you couldn't really tell what was going on. But of course, everyone knew that when we made a god, it like really never really because there's like die rolls that would kill you when you first saw him, and, and uh, so it didn't affect it that much. But yeah, when I made the mod, I made a, what I did, I made a list of the monsters, and I tried to I tried to reflect. I was being anomalous, I guess. I was trying to reflect what the monsters were like. Seemed like in the stories, and then I added extra monsters like the Dark Young is purely my invention, and uh, some things like that. And some monsters, Lovecraft's mentioned the, the, the hunting horrors of Dark did X, and that's yeah. all the reference to it in all of Lovecraft. He uses the words hunting horrors together. So I said, okay, you gotta have a monster to be that. And so there was now a monster to be that. And I tried to work out other details, and I tried in general to make the monsters the puniest monsters, like the deep ones, right? But they're essentially as tough as or a little tougher than a person. Because it's a horror game, so it's not meant. Yeah, it didn't have to have kobolds that you could beat easily, kind of work up to stronger things. Because the players can't work up to stronger things. The players you're are. Not gonna eventually kill the player, you're not going to eventually kill. Well, you do in Shadows of the Oxen, right? You send them that blow. But that's um, the best result. Is that you just get yeah. it. Exactly. Well, that's you the stall it for a while. So yeah, I, I worked with all the monsters and, and uh, made a big list of them and put them together, and then others were added later on. But it was because we had to have bad. They had to, they had to have rules for the, for the monsters. I tried to make the rules loose enough so players could do different things with them. And in the scenarios, I'd make that clear. You know, the, you know the, the monsters. Who's and then, who, you know. And then the Peter Oh, the monster guys. The field the guys. Field guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's are amazing. Yeah. Oh, Most tried to bring out some of Even though you see a picture of it, it gives a, 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 a ecological description. They tried to have. It mystery by not making it unclear what something, we don't know what those organs were that they have, and they, we don't know how they eat, or what they eat, or why they do these terrible things. And I found that the Green Ones one was an excellent gift for non green ones. Mark Burns? Who uh, very much enjoyed that. I found that the actual, the original one, the Green Watch one, was uh, not a bad gift. They like looking at the scary ball. One of the things about Tom Sullivan and the art for the first one is that he was able to have two different, like Lovecraft had a lot of monsters that blobs. So in this book, there's like five or six monsters that are essentially all blobs, but they look completely different. Because like, you can tell, you can tell the the uh, the uh, the formless spawn apart from the all the other the Shoggoth. You tell that apart. They, they all look different in the way they are blobs, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, I had some friends who are authors, including says I hate Belgium. I really enjoyed reading some of the books he gives. Which you know, when you're talking to someone who sold millions of copies of books. Are you looking for something you might like and something that really appeals? I guess it was a precursor to, uh, um, uh, what's his name, Guy of the Aliens. Um, not Baker, what am I thinking of? Lane Barlow. Barlow. Barlow's Guy of the Aliens. Uh, a precursor to that. Except that's all, it's all full cloth. Well, no, it's aliens from science fiction books. Yeah, but. That, that couldn't all exist in the same universe, but you know. Definitely. Yeah, that's an elder thing. What? He does an elder thing in that, too. Yeah, he does. He has no elder. Yes. But, but his art style doesn't make things so scary in that book, so... Well, he, he's scary. making them... He's making the aliens as if they were real toys. creatures, you know? He's, he's thinking through the way they would bend and move and be structured. And he, by doing that, he brings them into our world and kind of demystifies them a little bit. I would love to have seen what I'm he would have done. Tom Sullivan's Elder thing looks like it could move and bend and be in our world, but it looks really creepy. And well, yeah, Barlow's, yeah. Bar Barlow's are, for, are more like scientific illustrations, yeah. medical yeah. illustrations. Yeah. Idealized yeah. versions of aliens. Mm -hmm. They all look kind of plastic -y. but that's not yeah. necessarily a, saying he's a bad artist. It's like a plastic aliens, right? When he does his own things, you know, when he's writing his own monsters up instead of things from the other people's stories, then they actually are stronger. Oh, yeah. Darwin IV. Darwin IV is pretty good. Um, yeah. I like to have seen what he was done. looks pretty cool. On Mountains of Madness, because he was working on that for oh, yeah. the Toro. The great unfilmed movie. Yeah. Yeah. Avatar. What? Avatar. He worked on Avatar? I believe he was the, the character, so. the monster one of the monster concept artists oh. on Avatar. There you go. So 30 years later, um, people are still playing it, and there's so many versions, it's hard to keep up with gas. Well, when it came out, Lovecraft was unknown. 
almost hardly anyone knew who Lovecraft was. He could, it was hard to get a hold of his books. They were a few of the bookstores were in Valentine editions. There was a few of them, right? You couldn't find Arkham books anywhere, of course. So that's how it was. And and now like Cthulhu is like this huge meme on the internet. And yeah, plus Cthulhu. Yeah, you get, you, well, yeah, part of it's a joke, right? But but Cthulhu is super well known. I think part of that. I know that that that, that the royalties from Call of Cthulhu helped fund the new editions of Arkham House books. And uh, so that, I don't know how much that had on the, on the culture, but Lovecraft movie started to appear. I don't know if that was influence of all like Call of Cthulhu. But the combination of those things, I think Call of Cthulhu is part of it to make that, because the people that play Call of Cthulhu are the role playing crowd and the internet gaming crowd and the vlogging crowd. And that I think that's, Call of Cthulhu is at least part of the reason that Cthulhu is known today. And that there are Lovecraft, you know, more Lovecraftian games and movies. So. And another nice thing, movie in the 70s is tough. Okay, another nice thing about the, the rule set is you can modularize it into other basic role playing type games. So you can run RuneQuest players through a, a call of Google encounter. That was great guy things and used this rule system for writing dark worlds, what they call it, not call of Google. They don't want to call it dark or worlds. You can, yeah. and, and then they say, let's call it call of Google. And I said, but yeah, but if anyone, I actually, has anyone heard of Cthulhu? They won't know what it means. And they said, well, Lovecraft fans will know. And I guess, yeah, I guess Lovecraft fans will know. You know the, and I was thinking there'd be like you know, you know, a few hundred of them, maybe a few thousand, and the game would sell a little bit, and then it would go away if we managed to be on forever because like, how many guys are going to call Lovecraft? But uh, then I started meeting people who said, I never read Lovecraft, but I love your game, and it's hard to read Lovecraft. Or maybe he even didn't start reading Lovecraft. And so, the game took on the independent life. It seems like the Valentine surprised. edition started coming out more frequently once the game came yes. out also. Yes. Sales went up. People, people told, people, many people told me they went out and bought books. Or some of the books. That's what. I've seen a modularized from science fiction. Stuff from, you can take the, the Call of Duty rules, and you can take parts of it, and just kind of move it over. Well, that's the basic role playing system. It's not really Call of Duty. Yeah. I, I was given that system to use. I realize it's the system, but I'm saying because it shares that system, if you decide you want your characters to encounter a shotgun. Oh, yeah, you can just take a shotgun and put it in, in, in room quest all I want, or, or it's not ordered to sell it. You know, you it was a flexible system. Um, I guess it's largely extinct now, but, uh, but it was, you could, you, could take a monster, you could take a monster from the Elric and put it in the coffee and it would just work. It was, it was whatever, whatever happened, basically. It's still out. It came out what, a year ago? I suppose you can buy it in yeah. better gaming stores near you, right? Did anybody have any questions for Sandy or Steve? I like monopolize the whole conversation. I can quite I mean, for, 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 since 1988, I've mostly been trying to do things with, uh, with the computer games, so I've tried to put Lovecraft monsters into Quake and Doom and things like that. Well, you've got that iPhone application. Yes, yes, it has no monsters in it. <laughs> it's got cultures. Flower country? It's a garden. The flowers. Thing. Oh, that one. Yes, that one. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, that one is. Uh, it's stalled right now. We're waiting for an influx of money. So. I have an observation and a question. Uh, my observation is, uh, you know, you, certain uh, game systems, you, you see they always have new editions coming out, and they're always changing and fiddling everything, and people like one edition, don't like the other, and they won't play each other's editions. That, my observation is. It's all the same. Call of Cthulhu, I mean, there's not. Well, the best edition of Call of Cthulhu is, is the fourth edition, because that's the one where they have my picture on the back cover. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> the one you like to sign with us? Well, the other ones don't have my picture, so, I mean, fourth is best. Okay, fourth is best. They took my picture off the other ones. That's, that's, that's no good. Brian makes a good point, though. That you, can, you can pick up a sixth edition rule book, and you've only played first edition. If there's yeah, it all fits in this line. No, but it's not the yeah. same. People aren't. There's not a, a, edition bashing. You know, oh, I only play. I'm a... I'm a sixth edition oh, man. Like a third edition of the hardback. It was it. The yes. system was flexible. That, again, not my system. It was, it was given me, but it was flexible enough that it didn't have to be changed ever. The, the question I have is, is it better to uh, discover the mysteries and go insane or to, to not explore and be safe? Would you want to read a horror story where the guys <laughs> didn't explore and were safe? And the world ended. You want to see a movie <laughs> where... They say, someone says, hmm, there's an old spooky house. Our car broke down on a, on a stormy night, and there's an old spooky house. Do you want them to stay in the car? No, we want them to go into the house and, 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 and be eaten, right? And that's, exactly. what, that's the point. So 
Well, not only that, but a lot of times if you don't do something, something bad, really bad is going to happen. But remember, making a character in Kung Fu is super, is pretty fast for a reason, so that you don't have to be attached to him. Because your character you've had for a long time, what are his benefits he's got from all that time he's played? A couple extra percents and skills and the lower sanity, right? That's what you've got. Maybe you've got an old book that you don't dare read, okay? Or a skull that blows a nice and sometimes talks to you that you shoot in the mouth and you can't get rid of it. Okay? That's that's what your long term character has, maybe. So you gotta get your guy gets skills, it's not a problem. I think now I'm gonna be a professional baseball player, right? As your new character, right? I had a guy do that in one of the campaigns. He had a baseball bat, he used it for monsters. That was so his that's logic. What you can do is you can take a, older characters, retire them and make them a resource. So well or or more commonly, older characters go insane and then in the later scenarios they come back as monsters and cultists. Yeah, he's the black <laughs> vampire, right? Now he's a vampire. Well, yeah, they're, they're so you can recycle characters a lot of ways. I don't know if this is a question or an observation, but when I started playing running Call of Cthulhu as a keeper, everybody thought I was doing it wrong. Because nobody died. A few <laughs> you don't have to kill them! That's what I said, because I told them, look, the rules say that the monster may appear one every tenth game, and they said the object is to go against the high priest and the cultists of this thing. With your Tommy guns or whatever. Sure. You can kill them. Burn down their house. Well, they can kill you too, but you know. But you want to yeah. get rid of them before they summon the monster. That's yeah. why you're out there. Exactly. You know, well, if your players are complaining, then you need to sh shift your gameplay to make them happy. That's what I would say. Well, go ahead and kill them all. Then. <laughs> <laughs> if they're saying, I just, kill us too much, I'd say go the other way, right? Yeah. Well, I have more fun. It's like, I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to have a lot of fun watching you, like, drool and go crazy. And well, that's another thing. You don't have to kill guys in Call of Duty. There's lots of ways to handle the characters. They're bit by the world. They're not dead, but you know, they yeah. may not be a functional character very long. Okay. You know, they're they're uh, they're bit by, you know, there's all these things that, that happen. I mean, going I would guess going insane is at least as common as being killed. And then there's like being transmogrified yeah. and yeah. being possessed, being cursed, all the other. Yeah, they thought they were being thrown into deep Oh yeah, carry away. Yeah, the bego don't ever kill you, right? They just carry off in a can. You get to live forever in the can. Isn't that awesome? You win. Yeah, exactly. That's just awesome. Just awesome. Oh my god. Anybody else have anything for Sandy and Steven? Or other questions? Do you want to change change the topic? Talk about philosophy. Is there a five I, I actually did have a quick yes. question. Um, uh, could you say a little bit more about um, the birth of the sanity rules and okay, here's sort of how the sanity rules? I knew that. I, okay, in the stories, people see the monsters and they they faint dead away, and they are shocked, and they and they go insane, and terrible things go on. And they don't want to read the books because they're too scary, and they shudder with fear when they're told the true origin of Cthulhu and stuff like this, right? So I wanted to have some some way of showing that, and I wasn't sure how to do it. Okay, there's no, I had no tools to do that. So in a Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine, that was the name of the magazine, it mostly was Tumble Control for other things too. There was a guy who there was a, there was an article. And in the article, the authors had this system where you had like a, I forget what they called it, it was like a stability number or, a, or okay? And if, if you, whenever you saw something terrible, you'd roll, you'd make a saving throw against your stability. And if you failed it, then you'd freak out a little bit, and if you exceeded it, then you'd be okay. And if you failed it super bad, it might go down a point. And it was another stat like int or con or anything, okay? And I said, hmm, a stat that can go down when you're scared. And this is, and then from there, that's where sanity came from. We have sanity score, and that the sanity limit that that if you lost too much, there was like there was months of dealing with sanity, and figuring out how it worked. But essentially, you had a number that would go down. That had two ways it would go down. There was, there was a there was a cap on it, and the cap would go down when you learned knowledge of the mythos. Well, you know how it works if you play Call of And then there was the actual number, which was usually lower than the cap, which would go down whenever you saw something terrible or your friend died or you did something unspeakably evil that the game master didn't want you to do. The keeper didn't like you killing that person. You killed, a, you killed that hobo, you know he was a cultist. 1d6 sanity loss, right? It was a way of not to punish the players, but make them act more sensible sometimes. And it's not often used for that, but it doesn't have to be because there. And so the players would, uh, and <clears throat> that's kind of where it came from, that the idea of they had a stat that went down, so I had a bigger stat, so it would go down more. They'd give me more to work with. That having, if, I, if the stat was like 3d6, like everything else, so your sanity was 10, but I couldn't have Cthulhu be a lot scarier than a Shoggoth or a Deep One, right? And uh, then I had then I had put the other limitators so that you had like two levels, of, three levels of sanity loss. There was like 
you're just shocked and you faint for a little bit, then there's the you go insane and it takes a while to get back, and then there is, okay, you're permanently insane and they can't ever get you back in five. So we just now became a DM character. Yes. <laughs> And all the relatives are dead because every single one of them has sent a letter saying, You must come help me investigate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and by the time you get there, they've already been bitten by the Star Empire. You know, it's, they've joined, they've joined with the ghouls and the Earth eating corpses. Do you have a favorite story of yours? Of Lovecraft? Yeah. Not really. Yeah. I mean, there's some I like more than others. He always tells. The outside. the outside is the first one I ever read. That is pretty cool. Pickman's model, I like a lot too. <clears throat> My current favorite story might be The Whisperer in Darkness because I just was executive producer on the movie of that. So what now on the IMDb. So there's the one that was done with Nigerian scammers. Neither of them. Haven't you guys seen the Nigerian scammer? No. Got, well, yeah, you know, he's he, offered me ten, my wife so offered ten million dollars just last week. Oh, there's a guy who exchanged emails from a Nigerian scammer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, ben Monroe. Ben Monroe. Ben Monroe. Yeah. That was hilarious, yeah. yes. It's a fun. And he was Herbert West. He said that he was Herbert West. Yeah. 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 The Nigerian guy said, I got $10 million for it. Yeah, he started talking about yeah, the terrible voices right here in his head and all these people. Oh, the guy said, I've got next. I loved it. He made a lot of money. Anyway, I don't know if you heard about it, but, but yeah. HBLHS did, they did the Kulu movie. They did the Whisper and Narcos movie, which I participated in as a.